Hello everyone, my name is Julie Clegg and welcome to the first event in our series on Catholics and COP26. And may I now introduce to you my co-organiser, that's Marion Pallister from Pax Christi Scotland, who is the chair of Pax Christi Scotland, and she's also going to be chairing some of the events in this series. Marion, over to you. Hello, and um, what a, a way to start COP26. Uh, Pax Christi Scotland is a member organisation of Pax Christi International, the Catholic peace movement founded in 1945, and there are now 120 member organisations worldwide promoting peace, respect of human rights, justice and reconciliation throughout the world. Grounded in the belief that peace is possible and that vicious cycles of violence and injustice can be broken, Pax Christie's member organisations, like ourselves, address the root causes and destructive consequences of violent conflict and war. So what has that got to do with the climate emergency? What is climate emergency to do with peace? I think as we progress through this series of events over the next 12 days, that will become increasingly obvious as we hear from speakers across the globe who are daily experiencing the effects of this crisis. If we cannot sustain a, a livelihood because droughts, floods, fires and weather patterns drastically damage our ability to maintain food security, then our peace of mind is affected. Our society's peace is threatened and our migration elsewhere to seek safety and security endangers the peace of receiving countries. So with climate and peace so inextricably linked, it was clear that Pax Christi Scotland should join forces with Glasgow University's Theology and Religious Studies Department to present Catholics and COP26. I thank Julie for the opportunity and I look forward to hearing how Catholics around the world are working to conserve our common home. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Mariam. And guys, we are going to have Father Jerry McGuinness joining us at some point, I hope. Father Jerry is the General Secretary of the Scottish Catholic Bishops Conference, and he's also the Chair of the Care of Creation Office of the Scottish Catholic Bishops. But Jerry's now a member of the Vatican delegation, so he's part of the scrum down at the Conference Centre, so he might be a little late to join us. And now I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, but let me just introduce Mary. Uh, should I, should I, shall we just have a little look for Jerry amongst our participants? Is Father Jerry still in the scrum? It sounds like he might be. Okay, well, let me introduce our first speaker, and that's Mary Colwell. Mary, you might know, is a multi-award winning writer, producer, and conservationist. She produces programmes on the natural world and on environmental issues for BBC radio and television. She publishes on religion and conservation issues across the print media and online and works with many church groups and civil society organisations to raise environmental awareness. Mary's spearheading a campaign to introduce GCSE secondary school qualification in natural history in England and Wales. A brilliant idea. And Mary's a passionate campaigner to save Britain's endangered curlew population. You might be able to see some of those in the uh, areas around Glasgow and wider Scotland. Mary's the author of Beak, Tooth and Claw, Living with Predators in Britain, Curlew Moon, and John Muir, The Scotsman Who Saved America's Wild Places. And John Muir is going to focus or feature in what Mary talks about today. She's going to talk about three prophetic voices, St. Francis of Assisi, John Muir and Pope Francis. 
Welcome, Mary. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, hello, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting me. It's, it's such an honour. Um, the more we talk about this big issue, the better, and there is no better time to really start to look in depth at, at what's happening and what has happened in the past, try and form a sort of creative amalgam of everything so we can go forward with some really creative solutions for the future. So I've chosen only three um, great figures from the past um, to see if they shed any light on today's really deep and complex problems. Well, I don't need to tell you why we're all gathered. Um, COP26 uh, is just kicking off now. Um, it's been bigged up everywhere as the last chance saloon for the earth. I'm not sure that's true, but it's very good to, to bring everybody's minds to focus and how often do you get such big and important people in the same room. So it's very, very good that we shine a light on COP26. And out of that has come so much stress and anxiety. And I don't know if you are like me, are feeling very anxious at the moment about the state of the planet and you know, it, it, it sort of bears down on you, doesn't it? And right at the time when COP26 is happening, um, certainly around Glasgow, I think, in the north of England, there's been these terrible floods again. Um, we're only at the start of winter as well. And look at the, the, the weather map going through. So we're reminded physically about what's going on. Um, it's making that adding to that anxiety and to that worry about the future. So we're in a... We're in a, a tense place, I would say, at the moment. And when you're in tense places, you look for certainty and you look for visionaries. Now there are a hundred million visionaries out there. And many of you uh, today in the audience will be visionaries. There are high profile ones like David Attenborough and Greta Thunberg, of course, um, but there are many, many others as well. And these prophetic voices, uh, someone said this, I'm going to talk about Attenborough and Greta Thunberg, and they said, well, how do you know they're prophets? Because it hasn't come true yet. You can only be a prophet if their prophecies come true. And, um, well, I said, I think they probably are uh, coming true as we speak. But these voices and all the voices of the prophets, uh, modern and old, must all have felt very similar. That actually you're on the outside, that actually you're speaking to a world and you're shouting out to a world that doesn't particularly want to hear what you've got to say, that you feel as though you are in a bit of a wilderness, that idea of a prophet and a wilderness go together, don't they? Um, a prophetic voice can be seen as both calling from the wilderness or the margins and calling us to the margins. So prophecy is all about being on the, on the edge of what's mainstream. It's all about being around and about and not being in the heart of things because in the heart of things is where it's all going wrong. So prophets throughout the time, throughout the ages, um, must feel isolated figures that shout to a world that often has its fingers in its ears going, can't hear you. So I've chosen three of those people in the past We've got great issues today, but there have always been issues on the earth. And today's prophets stand on the shoulders of giants, huge, giant figures that had so much to say that smashed the status quo, that just came into society and said, this is not the way it is. Let me tell you how, how it is. And these are the three that I've chosen, three people who are utterly inspirational for me. St. Francis of Assisi, so famous as the, as the nature-loving saint. Um, I always adored him as a child, and uh, I think he is the I think he is sort of top of the top trumps of saints, isn't he, for a lot of a lot of people. Everybody loves this sort of gentle nature-loving side of him. Um, but he was an absolute revolutionary. He was a revolutionary figure who went and shouted at a society that had a very different view of the world than he did. I mean, people must have thought he was bonkers talking to birds. I mean, seriously, um, at a time when the natural world was very mysterious and was much more layered than, than we have today, but it still wasn't an equal. And he was this man, not an equal, 
a part of a family. And here was this man calling the birds his sisters and calling fish his brothers and calling a cicada his brother and calling the moon his sister. And it was, he was talking to the natural world in these terms which were relational, which were as though I can have an actual one-to-one -one relationship with you. That was absolutely revolutionary, that we are all one family on one journey. That was his message to the world. And it, it one of the big messages to the world. And that must have just made people just think, I have no idea what this man's talking about. And he was 700 years ahead of his time. Because as we know today from modern genetics, we are all fundamentally interrelated with all life on earth. You know, we are 98% the same as a bonobo chimp. And we're 50% share the same genes as a cabbage. So we are in this together. We are all related. And so St. Francis was this incredible voice that, that stood out, pointed to the natural world and said, I'm with you in this one. You and I are together. Gather round and let's praise God together. You know? His follower, St. Anthony, bizarrely, and I didn't know about this story, I feel very ignorant until recently, did the same with fishes. So uh, St. Anthony was a, a Franciscan and uh, he gathered all the fish of the sea to come and listen to him preaching. And they all were amazed and there was, you know, such a delightful story. I mean, you know, extraordinary story. And he said that they were far more receptive to the voice of God and to the, to the message of God than were any of the heretics that he was trying to convert at the time. And so he spent time, St. Francis, the Franciscans, his message at that time was that we are part of a living world and that living world gives praise to God. So we should all be respectful and kind to each other. If you have men who will exclude any of God's creatures from the shelter and compassion and pity, you will have men who will deal likewise with their fellow men. It's such a beautiful saying that. It's saying we have to be kind. We have to be kind to each other and to the natural world because kind, the root of it, based in kin, relation, relational, that is what St. Francis was all about at heart. He was a man who saw a living world with which we had a relationship and we were duty and morally bound, bound to be kind to it and to each other. So for St. Francis to me, um, at a time when we thought that, that humans were utterly, utterly different to everything else around them, smash that apart. There was a most beautiful story, the one that um, I found and have always found, perhaps the most beautiful story I know, which is St. Francis and the wolf, and which is why I think St. Francis is such a powerful figure at the moment. Um, St. Francis in the town of Gubbio, uh, on the outskirts, uh, there was a forest at that time, there was a forest, and this uh, wolf lived in the forest. And the wolf was obviously starving because people would take away a lot of its prey base uh, through hunting, whatever. And it started to attack a lot of the livestock and occasionally attack people. And people were terrorized by this great big male wolf that lived just outside the city walls of Gubbio. And they kept trying to go out and kill it and get rid of it. And St. Francis came and said, there is another way. There is another way to deal with the natural world. And he walked out into the forest um, alone, into where he knew the wolf was, where everybody was afraid to go. And the wolf came up and lay at his feet. And the saint and the wolf, they talked to each, each other. They communicated. And St. Francis said, I know you're hungry and I know you're frightened. And I promise you that the people will feed you if you stop terrorizing them. And the wolf laid its paw in his palm and the pact between man and the natural world was sealed. So St. Francis made a pact of peace with creation. And so the, the, our initial response, those people's initial response, our response today is no different. That creature's calling me, causing me a problem, I'm going to kill it. So St. Francis said, there is another way. There's a much more creative way to share this planet. 
Let's form a, an alliance. Let's form a, a pact with the world which is based on compassion, mutual respect. Let's lose the fear. Let's lose the anger. And let's see what we can come up with, which means we can live together. I find that the story of today. And I, I would love it to be known right around the world. And then we come to John Muir. John Muir was born in 1838 in the uh, east coast of Scotland in Dunbar. When he was about nine, I think it was, he went over to America. He was born into an incredibly evangelical um, sort of austere family. Uh, they went over to Wisconsin and became frontier family, really frontier farmers. He grew up in a very restrictive if, uh, environment, but quite quickly as a young man, he set off won't go into all of his life, but he ended up walking through America and then going to California and living in the fabulous Yosemite Valley, there it is, um, and living really as a hermit um, for seven years in the base of the Yosemite. And he spent that time exploring it. Um, and he wrote some of the most beautiful things that have ever been written about nature. I find his words move me to tears, even still, and I know them pretty well now. And in fact, just recently I've put out a tweet because everyone's feeling so anxious. Just read a quote, one quote from John Muir a day between now and the end of COP and let him soothe your soul in this very troubled times. And John Muir was 100% with St. Francis. He used to say, if you, have, if you find a flower that you've not seen before, sit down and spend some time, get to know it. In fact, spend half a day chatting to it till you get to know it a bit. He absolutely saw the natural world as part of his family. And he called them, he called them um, uh, uh, sort of wild creatures. He called them uh, nature people. He actually used that word nature people. And he had a real affinity with the natural world. So much so that he, he said he almost became, it was almost Buddhist-like in, in the way that he became one with it. This was his world, this is the Yosemite, this is the Sierra Nevada, where he spent so much time. He didn't go out into the, um, he wasn't known for cities, he hated cities, but he loved this and he wanted everyone to come to this. This, he said, these wild places are where you will meet God. You will meet God and cares will fall away from you. You will see the divine in a way you have never seen it before. People were frightened at that time. People were really frightened of wilderness. It was a place where wild things lived and you could, you could, terrible things would happen to you. And he said, nothing will happen to you. Nature has a warm heart. Come and spend time with a warm heart. It was such beautiful writings. And he, through the power of his pen, and because he was such a charismatic character, he managed to turn the heart of America. So he, in, he wanted people, everyone, to go and experience nature. But he also reiterated what Fran St. Francis said, and he recounted a tale of a mother pig and some, some little piglets, and somebody came to try and uh, steal the piglet and, and run away with it. And he wrote, the solemn awe and fear in the eye of that old mother and those little pigs, I never can forget it, was an unmistakable and deadly fear as I have ever saw expressed by a human eye and corroborates in no uncertain way the oneness of us all. He, he, he worked on farms, he, he worked as a shepherd for a while, and he saw that con complete connection with the natural world. And he talked about... And he invited it. 
and it absolutely broke his heart. It broke his heart that people went in and could stand at the foot of a tree which you and you and I probably, unless you've been there, have no concept of the size of these things. They are absolutely enormous. And they just cut them down as though they were nothing. And in fact, so much so they that th this very utilitarian approach to the natural world was so powerful that people even had tea dances and threw parties on the sort of sawn off bowl of the of the trees. He said, you know, he said trees, any fool can cut down a tree. He said any fool can cut down a tree because they can't run away. And God has protected them through, through millennia of storms and fires. And he said, but God cannot protect them from fools. Only Uncle Sam can do that. And he really campaigned for protection of these great and beautiful forests. And he said to people, that this is not just a matter of doing the right thing. It is about being more human in yourself. This will make you much better as a human being. If you care about nature, if you see your relationship with, with creatures, if you embrace the natural world. He said uh, when he was living there in, in the Yosemite, oh, these vast, calm, measureless mountain days, inciting at once to work and rest, Days whose light everything seems equally divine, opening a thousand windows to show us God. Never more, however weary, should one fall by the way who gains the blessings of one mountain day. Whatever his fate, long life, short life, stormy or calm, he is rich forever. So it's not just good for the natural world, it's good for us too. So his, his messages were so multi-layered. So much so is fame. Could you imagine this today? That the president of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt, wrote to him saying, I want to drop politics for three whole days and go camping with you in the wilderness. And so Roosevelt took John, John Muir, took Roosevelt out into the Yosemite. This is a high part. You can see the Yosemite Falls there in the background. Um, and they off went, just the two of them together, to camp out. And... Um, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall because both Roosevelt and John Muir apparently talked a lot. I think John Muir was a real chatterbox. I think he was quite hard to keep quiet and apparently so was Roosevelt. So I've no idea who won, but probably Muir because at the end of it, he persuaded Roosevelt to establish Yosemite as the first national park, proper national park in America. And from then they rolled out around America and then they rolled out around the world. So John Muir was the founder of the concept of the National Park, if you like, this place set aside just for nature, but for us to access nature. So he was a great activist as well as multi-layered in his thinking. And then we come to today, Pope Francis. And Pope Francis, I have no doubt, knows about the writings of John Muir, obviously knows about the writings of St. Francis, but he knows about everybody else as well, because Laudato Si is full of references to these great giants, to Wendell Berry and to Schumacher and to all the other people that he, that he takes their ideas, reforms them and reshapes them and, and comes up with his own synthesis in Laudato Si. Laudato Si is like, um, it's a love poem to the world, it's a love song to the world, but it absolutely draws on great wisdom from the past. And certainly back to the humble and simple and loving heart of St. Francis. He was loved, he loved and was loved for his joy, his selfless dedication, his universal heart. He was a mystic and a pilgrim who lived with simplicity and in wonderful harmony with God, with others, with nature and with himself. In him we find the extent to which concern for nature, justice for the poor, commitment to society and inner peace are inseparable. So Pope Francis has brought in other things into the mix now. He has brought in this justice for the poor, this sense of justice and peace in society we can only have if we follow the example of people like John Muir and St. Francis. So he added up, he's building it up. 
He's saying this is not just about us. It's not just about the natural world. It's not just about making us feel better. It's not just about our relationship with, 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 uh, with nature. This is about justice and peace. And this was a new and big revolutionary statement, which he put so beautifully in the Dato Sea, and which, of course, he drew on from, from Pope Benedict and John Paul II, too. But he lives in a world which is just so different. We all, with Pope Francis, live in a world which is unrecog would be unrecognizable to John Muir and to St. Francis. They saw destruction and they saw cruelty for sure, but not on this scale. This is something new. This is different. The world has never been under assault as it is at the moment. Fire, flood, drought, pollution, plastic. It's just the whole caboodle. You know what it is. The problems this planet faces, the human-made problems are absolutely enormous. And they come from inside a dark place that we have. This broken relationship produces this. It produces a terrible, vile sight. And all this world that gives in so much abundance, we treat with utter, utter disrespect. It is utterly heartbreaking to see what's going on. And although it's very difficult to see the news at the moment, it's horrible to be reminded of it daily. We have to look at all of these pictures, look them and look at them straight, say we are part of this. And all of us, every single one of us, is part of this problem. So Pope Francis asks us to not be despondent, to be realistic, but never to lose this hope and wonder and amazement. Something that, uh, that he knew, I am absolutely sure that he knew Einstein wrote. Einstein wrote about he who can no longer stand, the awe and wonder is as good as dead. So, so Pope Francis brings this to the fore and says that we, we have to have that relationship based on awe and wonder. This is a fantastic planet we live on. We mustn't sink into a broken state where we're just the exploiter of resources and unable to put a limit on our immediate interests. And they talk, talk about God in this, uh, the universe unfolds in God who fills it completely. Hence, there is a mystical meaning to be found in the leaf, in a mountain trail, in a dewdrop, in a poor person's face. The ideal is not only to pass from the exterior to the interior to discover the action of God in the soul, but also to discover God in all things. That's a really strong statement. We don't just discover God through prayer in a quiet room. We discover God in the natural world. God, the source of all justice and all peace. And then this passage, which I absolutely love. This is the passage that I will carry around with me and engrave in my soul. Since all creatures are related to each other, each of their value must be recognized with affection and admiration and in italics. And all we created beings need each other. Then he says something absolutely fantastic. Each region has a responsibility in the care of this family. So we should make a thorough inventory of species it houses with a view to developing programs and strategies of protection, taking care with particular attention to species in danger of extinction. This is, this is Pope Francis saying, you have to be naturalists, you have to be conservationists, and you have to go out there and do it. That's not just pray about it, not just stand there in all wonder. You've got to go out, look at your local environment, learn what's in it and protect it. What a call to action from a Pope. I absolutely love, I love that passage. And then he said, we are the people doing that and the people doing that now today, he calls them the authentic humanity. The authentic humanity, which lives in a new synthesis. And it seems to live in the midst of all the technology and all the stuff and almost imperceptibly like fog seeping under a closed door begins to infuse through this technocratic, damaging world, bringing a new synthesis. He calls us all to be authentic humans, be that mix in society, which says there is another way, there's another way to do this. And that's why I believe those three are fantastic prophetic voices 
and they certainly inspire me every single day. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mary. Let's reserve any more comment for the question time later and discussion section. Let me hand over to Dawn Northware, but first allow me to say a few words about Dawn and her presentation. Dawn is the Erica and Harry John Family Professor of Catholic Theological Ethics at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. She teaches courses in environmental ethics, racial justice, and fundamental moral theology. Her publications include Franciscan Writings, Hope Amid Ecological Sin and Climate Emergency, which is forthcoming with Bloomsbury next year, Ecological Footprints, an essential Franciscan guide for faith and sustainable living, a Franciscan view of the human person, some central elements, struggles for environmental justice and health in Chicago, an African-American perspective, and Franciscan theology of the environment, an introductory reader. So you can see uh, the way in which Sister Dawn is steeped in Franciscan spirituality and theology. And of course, it's Francis that she's going to speak to us about tonight. Her talk is entitled, St. Francis of Assisi's Canticle of the Creatures, a call for a moral imagination of hope and praise. Dawn. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So thank you very much and thank you for all the help. Um, today, uh, our planetary uh, condition of the climate em um, emergency calls us to uh, examine a little further the religious classic, The Canticle of the Creatures by St. Francis, who of course is the patron of ecology. And he first sang this canticle about 800 years ago. However, today, as we've heard, the Laudato Si once again compels us to turn from fear and despair and moral malaise to deepen our moral imagination and to live and act with hope and praise. Now, next to the Bible, there is likely no other source in the Western literature as well known as the canticle. Giovanni Francesco de Bernardoni's canticle gives superlative praise to God of all creation and beckons humans to moral integrity. Yet over the centuries, this poetic, literary, and religious classic has been tamed and robbed of its impact in many ways. It is quite common to see the canticle portrayed in romantic artwork or to hear it parodied in sweet melodies or to find charming figurines of St. Francis in garden statues or bird baths. And it's uh, sometimes, uh, oh, even depicted as he's treating house, house pets with, with some kind of romantic affection. Now that's not all bad, but it bespeaks a rather basic understanding of this great work. But the canticle really does have the ability to inform and enlighten us about moral and spiritual issues when encountering today's precarious state of creation. So in this presentation, I want to first look at the characteristics of a religious classic and then to begin to look at the, the canticle uh, through the uh, eyes of a 12th century person and to see how it was understood in Francis's context. And then uh, to look at it as we can see in a, another way when we look at uh, things through our own lens today. And then we'll end with a uh, the version of the actual canticle as it's found in the uh, Franciscan sources. Now in his book, The Analogical Imagination, theologian David Tracy claims that there are many works such as art, music, literature, dance, and many other ways where a culture uh, has in, invested in a timeless way of communicating and conveying the very soul of a people. And these expressions are identified as classics. Now for Christian religious classics, why we can see that Christians believe that we cannot know or comprehend God in our earthly existence. And thus our picture of God is in fact a metaphorical narrative of God's relationship with all of creation, including humans as part of the world. The Catholic classics assume God who is present in the world, disclosing the divine self in and through creation. 
The world and all its events, objects, and peoples tend to be somewhat like God. Now, all classics have five fundamental characteristics. They are most excellent, universalizable, shocking, hope-inspiring, and fecund, and we'll take each one of those in turn. Classics are most excellent. They are more than a period piece or fad. They express more meaning than what is momentary or provincial, and they are in no way glitzy or tawdry. Because classics hold such deep truths and are so dense in content, it takes time and effort to appreciate their wealth. A classic cannot be reduced simplistically. To do so is to do it a kind of violence, making it something that it is not. We must first know a classic's particularity before we can comprehend its universalizability. Secondly, a classic helps us look deeply at, a, at life and its meaning. The Bible and the scriptures of the major world religions exemplify this characteristic. In these world-renowned texts, we find interpretations of meaning and moral guidance through their treatment of major themes that touch the very core of human existence, such as human rights, power, the shape of a just society, compassion, tragedy, hope, human solidarity, or reverence of, of creation, and more. Classics are also shocking. As we live life, all of us interpret what we experience. Indeed, knowing is an active enterprise. Cultures, myths, metaphors, associations, symbols, memory, cognitive moods, all become lenses through which we can constrict or dominate or uh, limit our ways of knowing or our imagination. Classics shock us into a deeper reality, cutting through our narrowness, pettiness, and jostle our cognitive smugness and stretch us to the highest potential of human capacities. Classics are hope-inspiring. They pull us above the fray to our very best selves, away from indifference, the greatest form of violence that humans can exert. As philosopher Albert Camus put it, all literature is hopeful, silence is the product of despair. And finally, Catholic, uh, classics are fecund. They have a way of moving us into both internal and external action. They draw us into the heart of the intensity of the game of life. As theologian David Tracy put it, quote, in reacting to a classic, we have to abandon our own self-conscious intellectual control so that the energy of the game of life can take over. In every game, I enter the world so deeply and so fully that finally the game plays me, unquote. We can begin to understand what Tracy means if we recall that often one of the first things that happens when a totalitarian regime takes over is that it bans the classics of the state. Classics hold the deepest memory of a people, and in that sense, they are subversive to any other way of knowing. Classics are antidotal to any form of slavery of the mind, imagination, or the will. Thus, in claiming that the Canticle of the Creatures is a religious classic, we are also claiming that while it still holds some similarity of meaning for us, as it did when it was heard in the 12th century, there is potentially more to be known. Indeed, it is, uh, has potential to further interpretation, considering the conditions of our present context. With this in mind, then, we turn first to a brief review of the conditions under which Francis composed the canticle, and then we will see some further understanding that we can glean from it. In Franciscan literature, the detailed descriptions of Francis' composition of the song are found in the primary texts of uh, the Assisi compilation and the Mirror of Perfection. Together, these sources reveal that Francis composed the canticle in three parts, at three distinct times and during the last two years of his life. The first section deals with creation. It was composed during the winter of 1224 to 25, while Francis, suffering from an incurable eye disease, resided in a mouse-infested cell in San Damiano near Assisi, a small town in the Italian province of Umbria. The second part, dealing with reconciliation, was written to heal a feud between the archbishop and the podista or mayor of Assisi. And the final section, addressing sister death, was written shortly before Francis died. 
According to the Assisi compilation, the original section of the canticle was inspired and written in response to a vision in which Francis was offered a golden globe of the earth in exchange for his infirmities, and he was assured of eternal life. The alchemical symbolism of the earth changing to gold stood for Francis' conversion. In this vision, St. Francis experienced God's assurance of his salvation. The following day, Francis explained the vision to his brothers. We read the words from Francis from the CZ compilation. God has given me such a grace and blessing that he has condescended in his mercy to assure me, his poor and unworthy servant, still living on this earth, that I would share in his kingdom. Therefore, for his glory, for my consolation, and the edification of my neighbor, I wish to compose a new praises of the Lord for his creatures. These creatures minister to our needs every day. Without them, we could not live. And through them, the human race greatly offends the creator. Every day we fail to appreciate so great a blessing by not praising as we should the creator and dispenser of the, all these gifts, unquote. Francis went on to tell his brothers the manner in which they were to sing the canticle. And again, we turn to the Assisi compilation. His heart was then full of so much sweetness and consolation that he wanted brother Pacificus, who in the world had been the king of poets and the most courtly manner of so master of song, to go through the world with a few pious and spiritual brothers to preach and sing the praises of God. The best preacher would first deliver a sermon, then all would sing the praises of the Lord as true minstrels of God. At the end of the song, the preacher would say to the people, we are the minstrels of God, and the only reward we want is to see you live a truly penitent life, unquote. Thus, by Francis' own testimony, the purpose for the composition was simply to thank God for the creation creatures who minister to human needs and through whom human humanity offends God through the lack of proper appreciation and to lead people to penitence. In terms of the literary style and content, there is a wide agreement among scholars concerning the dependence of the canticle on the liturgy of the hours as it would have been recited in Francis' day. They recognized the parallels between the canticle and two liturgical texts, which were frequently repeated during the hour of lauds. Psalm 148 was recited every morning and the canticle of the three young men from Daniel 3, 56 to 88 was recited every Sunday and feast day. This accounts for some of the content of the canticle, but, what meaning is held in Francis' use of the earth elements and the cosmic bodies? What is, what is it about the content of this canticle that would have elicited in those who heard it a sense of conversion and penance? To explore these questions, we will briefly examine the context in which Francis wrote. First, it is curious the, a curious set of creatures that Francis chooses to call brother and sister. Only the cosmic elements of sun, moon, stars, earth, air, fire, and water are addressed in those familial terms. Something seems afoot here, especially since in both Psalm 148 and the canticle of the three young men, it is the animate world that continues to praise God. A look at the medieval understanding of the foundational place of the cosmic elements in the known universe of the 12th century can give us some important clues. In the 12th century, agrarian culture of the Umbrian region of Italy, people there used water, earth, and fire as remedies for healing illnesses. Educated people would have known Aristotle's astronomy and his natural philosophy. Franciscan med medical ethicist Thomas Nairn explains, the sublunar universe was seen as composed of various mixings of four elements, each of which in turn were reducible to various combinations of two pairs of contrary qualities, 
hot and cold, moist and dry. Air resulted from the union of the qualities of hot and dry, fire hot and moist, earth cold and dry, and water cold and moist. As philosophers use the qualities to explain motion and change, they also believed that the elements themselves were composed of opposing powers, which maintain an inherently unstable equilibrium. It was this foundational instability in the elements themselves that allowed it for a transmutation, that is a change from one substance to another, and to become the basis for the science of alchemy. Alchemy was the medieval forerunner of chemistry based on the transformation of matter. It was concerned with attempts to convert base metals to gold or to find a universal elixir, that is a medicine or potion. It is well known that Brother Elias, the first successor to St. Francis as Minister General of the Order, was an enthusiastic alchemist who hosted other friar alchemists in the residence at Assisi. In the medieval world, there was no clear distinction made between the human body and the world it inhabits. The boundary between the self and the world was a fluid one. In viewing the world, the medieval person was also viewing the self. So philosophers, theologians, troubadours, and poets all understood the human person as part of the larger world, but more, more specifically as a microcosm that mirrored the larger macrocosm and revealing a parallelism between the person and the world. While today's science reveals a distinctly different worldview, by viewing uh, 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 briefly and glancing at current existing evidence, we can begin to understand how the medieval thinkers might have drawn their conceptualizations given the limits of their day. Here we see Dr. Li Zhao, a researcher in biophysics in the Department of Molecular Biology and Genetics at John Hopkins University. And he, here we see a, an example of something similar today. In the upper uh, images in figure one, we see the bacterial cell division. During the process of division, a cell protein known as FTZ, FTSZ moves to the division site and forms a ring. The term is a Z ring. The top parallel in, uh, excuse me, the top panel in figure one shows the Z ring of E. coli cells projected along an axis of the cell. The cell itself is outlined with a yellow dotted line. The bottom panel shows the Z ring projected onto the cross section of the mid cell. The image of the Z ring is strikingly like two astronomical images. In figure two, we see the explosion of the Nova Singe in 1992. And in figure three, we see the supernova 1987A in our next door neighbor galaxy, the large Magellanic cloud. Amazingly, the supernova and the cell division are re all both related to the phenomenon of life. Earth, air, water, and fire in various combinations comprise the natural world within which people live. And the same four elements constituted the human person. The cosmic elements of sun, moon, and stars would have been seen by medieval peoples as powers which affected human fortune. This general understanding was substantiated by the scientific conceptions taught by Ptolemy. Ptolemy taught that the behavior of the sun and the moon and other planets and stars caused terrestrial effects and that extended into an infinity. Each of the celestial bodies possessed different powers and in their different positions, each had various effects which were helpful or harmful to humankind as a whole or to particular individuals. As the microcosm, the person found her or his very identity in the effects of earth, air, fire, and water. In this schema, there was a corresponding earth element for major bodily systems and a corresponding part of the universe for various body parts. Human flesh was of the earth, blood of water, breath of air, and warmth of fire. The head corresponded to the skies, the breast to the air, the stomach to the seas, and the feet to the earth. Thus, 
combinations of the contrary pairings of the qualities of hot and cold and moist and dry were the foundation for human temperament, and thus the four elements were related to the four humors. Earth related to the melancholic temperament, air to the sanguine, fire to the caloric, and water to the Flemic. Any imbalance among the four created illness and disease, both physical and mental. The constant goal of medicine in the Middle Ages was the same as that of natural philosophy, to restore balance among these elements. So now we turn to the exercise of the moral imagination that we might glean from all of this. We noted that Francis' purpose in writing the canticle was that he first expressed gratitude for the assurance of eternal life. He proclaimed glory to God for the personal consolation and for the edification of neighbors. He acknowledged that humanity offended God through maltreatment of creatures. And he had the canticle sung to challenge contemporary audiences to do true penitence, that is to reverse course, to change their ways. And Francis asserted the need for restoration of mutual relations among God, all creatures, and one another. In these ways, Francis stressed creaturehood as the cosmic elements. But what factor led St. Francis' contemporaries to actually see differently and thus to be moved to penitence? Looking closer, we can see that in each of the verses that name the elements, there is a movement toward God and a movement toward humanity. Brother Son bears the likeness of God, yet he brings the day to humanity. Sister Water is both useful and to humans and precious, a term Francis reserved only for the Eucharist. Brother Air and all the weather's moods are means by which God cherishes all creation. Sister Mother Earth is God's medium for feeding humanity and all creatures. Thus, Francis characterizes the cosmic elements in relation to God and in service to humanity. However, these images of the canticle are vastly different from the portrayal of the powerful cosmic elements perceived by Francis's contemporaries. The choice of his images are significant. Francis perceived sinfulness in his day to include especially human actions ceding to con cosmic elements more power over human life than they granted to God. Such distorted relationships were idolatrous, harmful, and thus sinful. Indeed, Francis seems to be making the claim that when confronted by the cosmic elements, humanity must remember that the elements are creatures of God. If this is a plausible interpretation, then the use of the term brother and sister in referring to the elements performs not only a relational function, but also a relativizing function. The terms may bring the cosmic elements understood as elements which influence humanity down to human level. Using the concrete images of the song, Francis stressed that his contemporaries should see the value of the elements as inseparable from humanity on the one hand and from God on the other. The focus of the song remains the praise of God. In fact, the lack of appreciation for France, that Francis decries is not only the lack of appreciation for creation, but also for creation's God. People misuse creation when they refuse to be moved by it to praise God. This understanding of the canticle brings to high relief a fundamental reality. Creation, which includes even the cosmic elements, serves God in serving humanity. But... As humans accept our place in the microcosm at, of this universe, we must also accept our ecological vocation called forth explicitly in Genesis 2.15 to work and keep the garden, not to exploit, manipulate, or destroy it. The two Hebrew verbs are significant, to serve it and to guard it. These are legal terms for guarding property of someone else, requiring vigilance and protection, holding one personally liable for losses and negligence. It is in fulfilling this ecological vocation 
that humanity finds true freedom. St. Francis biographer Thomas of Solano wrote in his first life of St. Francis, he called all creatures brother, and in a most extraordinary manner, a manner never experienced by others, he discerned the hidden nature with his sensitive heart as one who had already escaped into the glory of the sons of God. Considering all of this, we must now ask, in our climate emergency, how can the moral vision of the canticle lead us to freedom, hope, and praise? Clearly, in his Canticle of the Creatures, St. Francis of Assisi demystifies the cosmic elements by examining the base of human freedom in God. Thus, the canticle becomes a call to moral conversion. At the heart of the conversion is the need to return to the proper relationships between and among God and all creatures. When the common origins of human, humans and the elements of creation are acknowledged, then reverential and respectful relationships prevail. But when such relationships are exaggerated, absent, or abused, our moral vision is clouded. We live in a false reality. In short, we sin against our creator God, God's creation, and our own human dignity. In Laudato Si on Care for Our Common Home, number five, Pope Francis cites St. John Paul II's call to the world to seek ecological conversion. John Paul challenged all of us to commit to a deep reverence for creation, remembering the covenants, old and new, and mindful of our global community. These are his words. If one looks at the regions of our planet, one realizes immediately that humanity has disappointed the divine expectation. They have unhesitating, unhesitatingly devastated the wooded plains and the valleys, the polluted waters, deformed the Earth's habitat, made the air unbreathable, upset the hydrogeological and atmospheric systems, blighted green spaces, implemented uncontrolled forms of industrialization, humiliating the Earth, that flowerbed of God's dwelling. It is necessary, therefore, to, to stimulate and sustain ecological conversion. Humans are no longer ministers of the creator. However, as autonomous despots, they are coming to understand that they must finally stop before the abyss. Therefore, not only is a physical ecology at stake, attentive to safeguarding the habitat of different living beings, but also a human ecology that will render the life of creatures more dignified protecting the radical good of life in all its manifestations and preparing an environment for future generations that is closer to the plan of the creator. In this newfound harmony with nature and with our, themselves, men and women will once again walk in the garden of the creation, seeking to make the goods of the earth available to all and not just to a privileged few, exactly as the biblical jubilee suggested. In the midst of those wonders, we discover the voice of the creator, transmitted by heaven and earth, day and night, a language without words, which sound is heard, capable of crossing all frontiers. In Romans 1.20, citing the Book of Wisdom, St. Paul celebrates God's presence in the universe, recalling that, from the greatness and beauty of creatures, by analogy, the creator is contemplated. This is the same God who St. Francis of Assisi called the most high, all-powerful good Lord. It is this same creator God who now calls us to conversion. In our time of ecological emergency, just as in St. Francis' day, this same God offers us the golden orb, giving us hope in our ecologically troubled world. We need only repent, that is, we must change our ways. We must halt our abuse of God's creation. We must act with courage, reverencing our fellow creatures, our own dignity, and our creator, and do it now. 
I now invite you to a moment of reflection as we hear a musical rendition of the Canticle of the Creatures by St. Francis of Assisi, sung in his Omrian dialect. The English translation is provided in the green text on the screen. Potente bon Signore, tu e sonne la una gloria e l'onore, l'onore benedizione, e l'onore benedizione. Altissimo Signore, ogni potente bon
Yeah. 
failed to be moved by that wonderful ending to your talk thank you and what food for head heart and soul you gave us there and in fact this evening we've had four classics because we've got the classics that mary presented for us as well our religious classics of mm. saint francis pope francis and john muir to close our session tonight i'm going to hand over to Martin Murray, who lectures at the University of the West of Scotland in nursing studies. Martin, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I'd just like to, as a Glaswegian, to say anyone who's coming to COP to say how welcome you are to Glasgow. Uh, and if you're visiting Glasgow for COP, I hope you enjoy your time here and have the opportunity to see the city and some of the surrounding areas. Obviously, I'm quite biased, but I think Glasgow is one of the friendliest cities in the world. And we've got some of the most amazing scenery on our doorstep. So sometime, make the time to head out west to the Lord Clyde and out to Loch Lomond and remind yourself of the beauty of creation that's there on our doorstep and all round about us. It was marvellous to hear Mary speak about the prophetic voices of John Muir, of our Holy Father Pope Francis and our Holy Father St Francis. If you go across the Clyde from the COP venue and go down into the Gorbals, you'll see two banners that have been put up for COP up on the side of the Franciscan Friary down in Ballater Street. One depicting St Francis and one depicting Pope Francis and both asking the prayers from the passers-by to, prefer, to, to uh, pray for the success of the conference. 30 years ago, the uh, first essay I wrote as a Franciscan novice was on the canticle of creatures. So it was great this evening to hear Sister Dawn speak about the canticle and the great, great to hear a real expert speak about it rather than the writings of a very naive novice. When I was a student, our novice master would sing the canticle in um, Umbrian dialect, a slightly different version, a different tune to the one we've heard this evening. So it was great again to hear this evening, to hear it sung in Umbrian again and it brought back sweet memories. Reflecting on what's been said this evening and the church and the church's contribution to caring for our planet, I believe that one of the most important things that we can do just now is to pray for the guidance, to pray for guidance for all of those taking part in COP. We need to pray that the Holy Spirit will guide us and enlighten us. And, in, and, I've, and that's why I've decided to conclude this evening by singing the prayer that St Francis is reported to have said before the crucifix in San Damiano early in his conversion. Most high and glorious God, bring light to the darkness of my heart. Give me right faith, certain hope, and perfect charity. Lord, give me insight and wisdom, so that I always discern your holy and true will. Most high and glorious God, bring light to the darkness of my heart. Give me right faith, certain hope, and perfect charity. Lord, give me insight and wisdom, so I may always discern your holy and true will. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And we really look forward to seeing you all again on the 5th. Come and join us on Friday for more amazing offerings. But for now, good night, one and all.